This tape is called right hammerings. Got that? Right hammerings. It's important because when we were first booting around the idea for this video, there were certain people who you can tell had never been to a football match in their life because they said, why don't we call it great victories? As if anyone comes out of a football ground on Saturday afternoon, hears the results filtering through and says, oh, I see Leeds had a great victory. No, no, what you say is, I see Palace got a right hammering. Because that's what's important. Who was embarrassed? Who was thrashed, walloped, humiliated? It's that knowledge that makes the after-game drink that much sweeter. And the sweetest part of all, it's, it's those moments where you feel everything's for the best in this best of all possible worlds. A friend comes into the pub late and says, you know Arsenal got beat 7-1? Yeah, yeah, we do. It's on telly tonight. It doesn't happen often, but it is to those moments that this tape is dedicated. These days, thank God and quite rightly, every second of every football match seems to be preserved on video. But it wasn't long ago that an extraordinary scoreline would be lost forever, only recorded in pen and memory. For instance, the two biggest scorelines, I think, in British football history were Abroath 36, Bonner called nil, Preston 26, Hyde nil. Now, who amongst us wouldn't like to have that on tape? Instead, all we've got is a pen and ink engraving of the 15th goal big deal. However, some fragments of historic games do exist. February 1960, for instance. Tottenham Hotspur v Crew. That night, the team shared 15 goals. It's just that big, bossy Tottenham took more than their fair share. At least Crew were consistent. They scored twice in the first tie to hold Spurs to an honourable draw. And they scored twice in this one, too. Though hardly expecting to win, they must have hoped to make the big boys fight all the way. But nope. You mathematicians out there will have figured by now that we're watching the first of 13 goals Crew conceded that night. Spurs, by the way, are in black and white. A feature of the evening is a rather sad rolling dive affected by the Crew goalkeeper, perhaps just to let us know he was there. Of course, it wasn't totally one-sided, even though the score at half-time was 10-1. No, the record proves Crew got forward occasionally, though their shots were about as desperate as the ones the director bunged in for editing purposes. Crew naturally needed all the help they could get, and that didn't include this pitch. But the referee decided it was playable, although Moses might have decided it was partable. Still, Tottenham were above such inconvenience in 1960. Bang, there's another one. And another fine old corny cutaway of the crowd. This time featuring a haircut unlikely to go without comment these days, such as, oil, we're rich. Little Tommy Harmer fooled the defence every way, put Jones in possession on the left, and nobody could stop the winger. Jones sent it to Allen, and the inside left got goal number five. The very next season, Crew drew Tottenham again in the fourth round of the FA Cup, and this time the team shared six goals. You figure it out. That last goal is a perfect example of something you'll see a lot of on this tape, ugly supporters. No, it's when a game becomes so one-sided that forwards become bored of celebrating. be argued that that last result was no big deal. After all, it was Tottenham's heyday and crew have always been crew. But 13-2? 13-2. That's a result straight out of the Sunday Parks League. Besides, we're not dealing here in classic games or even upsets. What we're after is the full theatre, the majesty of football. Right from the kick-off when the team is optimistic, then they go a couple of goals down but still think something could be retrieved, right through to those final minutes of, oh God, Please let the earth open up and swallow us. The full horror. 
But that said, I am a bit of a doctor of soccer psychology, so I do understand the very basic human need to see Spurs suffer as little crew suffered. So... Webster, that one's for Durban. Durban's got his fellow number four, Alan Murray, with him. Oh, chance for Durban! He's there! Alan Durban scored a mistake by the Spurs defence, and Alan Durban made no mistake from that. I can't remember if Tottenham's away shirts in 1969 were pale blue or lemon, but judging by this hopelessly suicidal uh, clearance, let's say lemon. Tottenham, for some reason, played like a team who'd been on the beer the night before. McGovern for O'Hare. And Hector going through very fast. Kevin Hector in the penalty area. It could be number two. It's a goal. Yes, it must be over the line. Undoubtedly over the line. Beyond any shadow of doubt, Kevin Hector makes it number two. Yes, heavily on the beer. Sluggish, indifferent and puffed. For instance, what a splendid piece of judgment this is by Phil Bill as he watches the ball roll by and over the line without a shadow of a doubt. Gilzine. Putting it back for Pratt. Mullery inside him. Phil Bill. The cross now for Gilzine. Mullery. Greaves. Oh, good work by Greaves. And what a great save by Greaves. Some were clear-headed. Yeah, well, you wouldn't catch Jimmy hanging around the hotel bar in those days. Crowd boiling with excitement now. As Tenton goes across to take this corner. Derby County leading 2-0. And good football from both sides now. Here's the in-swing of my Henson. Coming in, up goes Hector. It's there, number three. Carlin, it's Carlin the scorer. Willie Carlin. A glorious goal by Willie Carlin, just flew off his head. And Derby County are almost incredibly three goals in the lead. Alan Durban. Roy McFarland is there, Willie Carlin. This is Carlin. Behind him is Durban. There's Durban. Oh, nice piece of play through the legs. O'Hare, it's a goal, a magnificent a truly appalling defence on the day, just begging to be hammered. Watch as there are five of them, five of them just loafing around like the pillars at Stonehenge. Inevitably, the crowd began to chant, we want five, although five would have let this Tottenham side off easy. The pace of the game began to slow down as Derby sensed Tottenham's submission and began to try to taunt them, embarrass them into making a game of it. Tottenham were content to be mere Valium made flesh. They rarely bothered to challenge and watched as if in a dream as Derby simply pushed it about. McGovern getting up. Hinton. McGovern. Joe Hare. Hinton and Durban's on the left. O'Hare. Hector coming up quickly. A good one. Number five. Durban. Durban makes it five. Spin that one back and watch Alan Durban celebrate with a first-class silly walk. Although in performing comedy, he seems to have strained himself. There's a bigger Tottenham shame day coming up. But first, here's a couple of games in which their opposition thought that White Hart Lane would be the ideal place for a 90-minute nap. The first match was to be a red-letter day for Forest stand-in keeper Eric Hume. That's literally stand-in keeper Eric Hume, OK? Finding Knowles. Again, Spurs beginning to dictate it. Knowles this time looking for Gilzean. Gilzean with his head, and Peters! And that's the goal! And one that counts for Martin Peters, with 20 minutes gone. Beautifully nodded down for him. Peters. 
and Neva. Peters has gone on the outside again. Beautifully played for him, and he is completely free. Chivers! Oh, a magnificent goal! Superbly created! And brilliantly finished by Peters and Chivers between them. A really magnificent Tottenham goal. Perryman. Kinnear. Gilzean trying to dummy Chapman. Again, and he's given a penalty. Goal number three. Three goals in five minutes for Spurs. Look, nice one there, Eric. Of course, when he finally did grab the ball, the referee went and blew for half time. In the second half, this cap that he grabs, well, it may as well have had bells sewn on it. The half began with Tottenham understandably full of fire and fun and Forrest displaying a bizarre anything-goes attitude that bordered at times on the plain silly. Pretty soon nobody's talking to each other, the hands go on the hips, the minds are obviously elsewhere. Possibly they're thinking, well, we're going to be relegated in 1993 anyway, so what's the point? Still Mallory looking for an angle for a shot, and getting one in! Alan Mallory, number four! Now knows. Played there for Chivers, and now for Pierce, is this the chance? Oh, a marvellous goal, and it's given without any doubt at all. The referee, in fact, looked at the linesman, he kept his flag down, and Pierce, from the sharpest of angles, really whacked it past Eric Hume. Surely the hapless Eric Hume by now. Keepers on off days are always described as hapless, and I've rarely seen a keeper with less hat. It was a belter of a shot, though. However, the next goal sees Eric defensively naked and performing the flapping dance of the damned, toing and froing before unleashing one of football's least convincing dives. And Peters, in fact, shivers. Now surely someone will have a go, and it's there by Jimmy Pierce. It almost looked as though Spurs had lost their chance. Pat Jennings applauds from the other end. It's actually an own goal, you know this. With Eric just a fingertip away, you watch as the four takes it off the head of the number six who had it covered. Toward the end of the game, Tottenham rather sportingly took some of their players off to even things up. Here we see the athletic-looking Forest bench watch as the inevitable, lonely, pointless consolation goal is scored. What nuisances consolation goals are, like giving a starving dog a rubber bone. Richardson bringing it away again for Nottingham Forest to Ian Moore. Skillfully getting past Knowles, putting it across there, and a goal! Here's a nice touch, the ironic laugh at the would-be celebrations of his teammates. Now, here's a game I remember so well, because it was on match of the day, and I fell asleep and missed it, and it's irritated me ever since. Again, good approach play by Tottenham. Here's Hoddle. Moore's got up there. Lee got it. Naylor shaking off Gould. Four Tottenham players ahead of him. Five now that Hoddle's made a run down the right. Just how the second goal came, really. Taylor! Peter Taylor makes it three. Alistair. Oh, a lovely dummy by Peter Taylor. He's got four in the middle as well. Oh, they all missed it and Morris! Morris put it in! Why does Tottenham number seven John Pratt hold his head as that goes in? Anyway, it's a hilarious goal and bears seeing many times. By now, Rovers knew the game was up. 
Oh, right up, right up over their heads. But surely even they couldn't have known quite how much was still to come. Leaving it. Moores is through. I've developed a theory about what happened to Bristol Rovers on this day. You've heard of a stealth bomber. Well, this must be a stealth ball because it simply refuses to show up on Bristol's defensive radar. And 6 0. Must have been said without taking anything at all away from Tottenham that Bristol Rovers looked a very poor side. Especially in defence. Oh, thanks, John. And as Moore's on again here for the hat trick. He's got it. He's got his third as well. There's some real Superman leaving via a window stuff from the goalkeeper here. What is he diving at? Perhaps to stop his own number three from running into the post. Oh, and John backs away. Lee is in the middle. Taylor trying to get there. It's going to come to Taylor now. It's come to Lee. Eight. Morse. Hoddle. He looked offside, perhaps, but the referee's given the goal. Unstoppable Tottenham, eh? Well, less than a year on, and the pile drivers become the pile driven. Case. Miss hit, but it's gone dog leash, and he turns and scores. Dermot put in by highway. The chest down by Perriman dropped nicely for Delgleish and now Kennedy. And soon as can he turn on it, pulled it back for Case. Delgleish! Dermot. Kennedy at the far post. on for McDermott Ray Kennedy in the middle the ball with Dalglish and now Johnson Sooness Dalglish did well to turn on the shot Johnson 4-0 to the Taylor with just Belia to support him at the moment and Case robbed him as clean as a whistle and now he's Dalglish put away by Ray Kennedy Dalglish for Johnson, number five. But it's like Moses parting the waters whenever Liverpool goes through the middle there. Highway for Sunis. Chip in for Alan Kennedy. Gets a second chance and pulls it across for Johnson. Off the line brilliantly by Duncan as Johnson was already celebrating his hat trick. Brilliant clearance by Duncan. Way. Can he get in on the score? Penalty! And Duncan, having just saved Spurs a goal, looks now as though he's given away the sixth by bringing down Highway. A collector's item, this. No, not a penalty at Anfield, but the fact is it looked like one, didn't it? Anyway, they missed it. So the referee said, well, take it again. Here's a weird one. They're 5-0 up, so why does Alan Kennedy feel the need for these theatrics? Can't bear to look, love is. After all, you know what they say, five goals is a dangerous old lead in football. Anyway, up steps Phil Neal and makes it 6-0. And Liverpool aren't done yet. Ray Kennedy to Dalglish. Johnson. And Johnson the ball 
into acres of empty space for Highway. And Highway, a brilliant crossback. And what a classic goal. Right now, Tottenham supporters are thinking, well, at least they haven't remembered December the 23rd, 1978. Well, we have, and it's next. It's just before we see that, it's Tottenham v Arsenal, by the way, we should say something about local derbies. Do you know anyone who actually enjoys local derbies? I mean, when the fixture list first gets printed, it's the first thing we look for. And yet, nobody can truly look forward to them, can they? They're a bit like some foul hybrid of a dentist trip and exam time anxiety. Sure, if you win, the emotional rewards are great. If you win, it's just that most of the time, don't you suspect that things like what we're about to see are just waiting to happen? Ardiles. Oh, and the back pass by Pratt is caught. Lacey and Sunderland's in there. And it's in! Sunderland for Arsenal! And the first minute... I really do think this is perhaps the most risible, nobody talked to him for a month style back pass I've ever seen. And it's John Pratt again. Perhaps that's why he was looking so shocked a year earlier in the Bristol Rovers game. He knew that this moment was out there, waiting for him. Ah oh well, first minute, 1-0. Plenty of time to turn this one around. Hoddle. That was Brady's pass and a beauty it was too to Sunderland. Stapleton on the far post. Sunderland shot, oh it's in, he scored again. Looks for Arsenal. Oh that was beautifully done between Ricks and Brady and Brady now has got Stapleton and Sunderland in the centre. Still Brady, beautifully done. Stapleton! 3-0 to Arsenal and a brilliant goal. Hey kids, lest we forget, the flared tracksuit. Come on, get him off. Every Arsenal player wants the ball. Three waiting again for the cross from Price. Stapleton. Oh, Pat Rice in there. Oh, Brady won it beautifully. Look at that! by Stapleton to Sunderland, if it's a hat-trick now, it is. And some things never change, the Arsenal bench as freewheeling and emotional as ever, and nice towels on the laps, fellas. And yet more capital punishment. This time, North versus East, and an Arsenal humbling of the ever-fragile West Ham. Fine with John Redford, out on the side for so long, but back to good effect now. Oh, Armstrong and Echo, forward with a shot, back to go! Exactly two minutes long. Ball. It's not a bad cross either. Rice right in there, Brady right in there, Kidd might get a shot. And a penalty! Penalty go. So, Mervyn Day again faces Alan Ball from about the sort of range from which Ball scored after two minutes. But now it's a simple matter of Ball against Day. And he's changed it. Armstrong back again. And Ball couldn't quite turn it in. And a free kick was flag given to West Ham. Finding Brook. Tried a little curler there to Billy Jennings. And it's there by Jennings. 1 1. And Liam Brady with a long one there. Mancini had come up for it. Now King. And another penalty. Is it going? 
going to be 1-1, one, one, or is it going to be 2-1 to Arsenal? It's 2-1 to Arsenal. He sent it the other way. Oh, I think we can take one more look at that divine clearance by Billy Bonds, eh? Incidentally, to any current West Ham defenders who are watching, we've got absolutely hundreds of moments like that. Wade is going to take this one. Mancini's right in there, jockeying for position. Curled in there to Radford. Hit the crossbar. And Kidd. Has he given it? Yes. He's given the goal. Brian Kidd has scored number four for Arsenal. It's good four. Armstrong again. Kidd. And that's another one. Brian Kidd remains strangely annoyed throughout this game. OK, he's upset here because his goal gets disallowed and he makes a bit of a fool of himself in front of his friends. Still nothing to upset a team winning 5-1, I wouldn't have thought. Moments later, he crashes the ball against the bar, and it's absolutely livid. I think here's a man who really hates West Ham. Fortunately, he does manage to get it all out of his system just a few minutes later. Oh, play through the kid again. Now, oh, will it be the hat-trick this time? It is! And whatever hump he was carrying, He's just dropped all over Mervyn Day. And so, to the 4th of November, 1982, Everton v Liverpool. For Everton supporters, it feels like it just happened this morning. They can still taste it, smell it, still feel it, touch it. Well, perhaps not touch it, but they must live with it, always. King. Action in so fast. And leads the charge. Rush to his left. Onside, Ian Rush. 1-0 Liverpool, brilliant goal. Marvellously made by Alan Hansen. And put away by Ian Rush with a bit of a fuss. Now, here's a bit of history. This would be Glenn Keeley for Everton hauling back Kenny Dalgleish in the days before the professional foul was a mandatory sending off. Nevertheless, the referee decides, quite rightly, to send him off. You want to know the punchline? This was Glenn Keeley's debut for Everton, and he never played again. Rush. Deflection has taken it in. Oh, he's got three, Dalglish. And put in by Larson. What a simple goal. And Liverpool here have got Everton on the rack. A thread is what they need to just get their game together. And Liverpool won't let them have it. Dalglish. Look at that, rushes through. This could be history here for Ian Rush if he scores. He's at the post. He might score now, he has. And it's the first hat-trick in a Merseyside derby since 1935. King has slipped. And this is where Liverpool have made the game look so easy. They've come out of defence, got into their stride and seem to get an extra man through. It's Ian Rush, can he score his fourth? It looks as though he has. Yes, 5-0. While we're talking about local rivalries, do you know I kind of miss the home internationals? You remember that little local World Cup we all used to qualify for? There was one particularly sweet game in 1961, and what happened was Oh, there go the Scots. They know what's coming. They've changed the channel to watch a cartoon for a while. Well, we're all going to see a little bit of low comedy now.
England nine, Scotland three. Ask yourself, yes, yes, Loch Ness Monster, yes, yes, UFOs. But what we're about to see, was this all part of some big elaborate hoax? Did such a game ever happen? Well, yes, it did, and here it is. About a hundred thousand were present when Her Majesty the Queen took her place. Eric Caldo and Johnny Haynes led their teams onto the field before the Scottish and English 11s were presented to Prince Philip. Then Scotland kicked off and almost at once the white-shirted Englishmen were on the attack. In the ninth minute, Bobby Robson scored. Yes, an early shot for the visitors, and England maintaining pressure. Then after ten minutes, Jimmy Greaves put England two up. Before half-time, a third, and slow motion shows a mistake by Happy, pounced on by Greaves. Just my cutler, mate. Scotland took up the tail in the second half and began to look like taking revenge. In three minutes, Dave Mackay's free kick got right through. Okay, well, June. <laughs> Almost at once, a Davy Wilson header made it 2-3. Intoxicating football. England, however, had their own ideas and drove down towards the Scots goal. A sharp free kick, Happy fumbles, a Douglas shot, and it's 4-2. England's fifth came from Bobby Smith. Scotland, still undismayed, now made a great effort. They were rewarded by a goal, credited to Pat Quinn. Then came four English goals in seven minutes, one from Johnny Hayes. Another from Johnny Haynes. Jimmy Greaves gets his third. Who duly noted by Scots, not to mention Italians. And Smith again with England's ninth. And we'll no get the fares back. But for a clear case of hands, England might have made it ten. But of course, English fans had more to cheer about. England's victory was overwhelming and well-deserved. So was the Championship Cup, which the Queen, who is patron of the Football Association, presented to Johnny Hay. It was a match that will long be remembered by soccer fans. Johnny won't forget it in a hurry. Good, eh? You know, while we were watching that, one of the engineers here said, uh, of course, if Cluffy was in charge of the side, would still be doing that to the rest of the world. Who knows, it's emotional and unprovable nonsense. But let it be noted for the record that Clough sides could be particularly cynical and savage whenever the opposition appeared to wobble. That's still the pressure mounting on Arsenal. And again, Davis gets it down. McGowan! Stopped by Simpson! And finally, Wilson pounces. So the early signs were it was going to be one of those afternoons when everything would go Arsenal's way. I mean, how much do you think Simpson knew about keeping that one out? But for the rest of the afternoon, Arsenal were to have no such luck. First ball, Simpson, oh, and Hector! McGovern! McGovern has scored it! John McGovern gets his first goal of the season! Two other things to note during this magnificent game. One, the marvellous white boots of Alan Hinton. And two, Hugh Johns. What a great commentator he was. And that's McMullen. No, 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 it's pushed back. Referee Jones says that he was not ready for the kick to be taken. Well, would you believe that? That was a case where you give a free kick to give a side an advantage. They take advantage of it. They knock the ball into the net and it's got to be retaken because the defence wasn't ready. 
Big Roger Davis. And it's come for Hinton. And he can whack it from there. Oh, yes! That will do for Alan Hinton. Hinton. Webster. Hinton the cross now. Oh, yes! McFarlane! Right on the post. It's 3-0. We want four, is what the crowd is shouting. Hinton might just be the man to deliver it for them. And that is Hector! And they've got their four! How about that? Wilson again, terribly exposed. As if Hector had listened to the crowd and says, OK, you want four, we'll give you four. So this dead ball specialist, Hinton. Far post, and that's Davis! That's another one! Roger Davis scores his first ever league goal. And another tragedy for Bob Wilson and the Arsenal defence. But before that argument about Brian Clough being the king across the water builds up any more steam, let's just take it off the boil with one date. December the 1st, 1973. And Brian Clough's infamous short reign down there at Brighton. When he arrived, the locals were strewing roses from top hats. It was all gonna be different now, happy days. But after a while, it was clear, things weren't channeling at all smoothly for Brighton Bry. If the emperor wasn't naked, he was starting to give the locals views of his pence. And then Bristol Rovers turned up, suddenly the pence were off. And now it's Dobson, virtually with his first touch, and war boys now being chased by Norman Gall and Gall was quite clearly holding him back and this is a goal yes scored by Bannister and Bristol Rovers in the lead with four minutes gone George Lay and Taylor once more getting it away to Warboys Bannister once more to Warboys and Dobson in a lot of space down the lane here's Dobson and three Rovers players up wanting the ball and there's number seven Burnley and that's number two a beautiful goal beautiful breakaway by Bristol Rovers with Brighton once again all over the place nice little payoff there to O'Sullivan wanting perhaps a little too much time but then getting in his shot Warboys turned on for Fernley. Controlled beautifully there by Gordon Fernley. Now for Jacobs again. Hit across that goal. Bannister's header. And there it is, another one. Number nine is Warboys. The number eight coming to the picture is Stanton. It's Warboys who hits it. And this is going to be the next one. And it's the hat trick for Bruce Bannister. Brian Clough at Brighton. Huge things were expected of him. Brighton was supposed to go sailing up the league. And he couldn't have picked a better day to bring the two boys, could he? Dobson on the far side in a lot of space. Turning it through once more. There's War Boys, number five. Unbelievable stuff here by Bristol Rovers. Five goals away from home. Spirit. Straight to Dobson. And into the path now of war boys this will be the number six i would think and it is a real smash and grab again they're useless aren't they dad i know son i know hey dad you think you better tell eddie to uh, come on come on eddie come on oh god parsons playing a long ball forward war boys is on side is this going to be his hat trick it is 7-1. I've let in seven goals. That's not so bad. Lots of teams get beat 7-1. Can't think of any at the moment. But it's not eight. That's the important thing. As long as today we don't get beat by eight. And here's Warboys onside. The linesman's kept his flag down. And that's his fourth goal. And Bristol Rovers, eight. Templeman.
Hilton losing it. Well, no, his uh, courage carried him through, and it found Towner. A low cross this time. And there it goes. That's the second one for Brighton. So, yeah, suddenly the Emperor had no clothes. And amazingly, just like in the story, it took a little boy, this one called Nigel, to draw everyone's attention to it. I've got Nigel Clough here with me. He wants to see the eight Bristol Rovers goals go in again. What did you think of Brighton yesterday? All right. All right. Oh, that's good. That's good. And that little boy grew up to be Ryan Giggs. OK, let's get back to some meat and potato mullerings. Uh, who's next? Oh, yeah, uh, time for Chelsea, Leeds and Burnley to get it in the air. The Chelsea one is particularly funny. They get Rogered at Rotherham. Rotherham. Goodick has scored in the last two matches and I thought he might come to a try. Fern has got Brecken outside him, could hit it. Oh, good effort from Brecken. And John Brecken has scored. What a dreadful mistake by the goalkeeper Barota. Well, in fact, it's two dreadful mistakes by the goalkeeper Barota, if you count that headband he's wearing as one of them. But at least here he's actually more animated than on the next goal, in which he appears to be almost offended that Rotherham score. Corner again looking for more across and that must be a goal for third. A long hoop ball which Pudding might get onto. Oh, he does, and Barota up his line, collides with him. It is a penalty. I thought it might be. He took an awful long time to decide. 13 minutes gone, and here's Ronnie Moore. And it's 3 0. He leaps for joy. And that is the most perfect start to a match. 30 minutes gone and Rotherham three goals to the good. The ball forward for Walker. Control was good, but on that occasion he was robbed. And Henson desperate for it on the far side. And Moore, and Moore is away again. But this time Barota can't bring him down. Moore's inside the area. There's the clip. It must surely go into net. And it does. And it's Rodney Fern again. Oh, now Fern, and he's got Gooding running in the centre-forward position, but he'll use Towner. And Hutchings must dread the sight of Towner coming at him, and there's the cross for Fern! Oh, what a goal! And what a hat-trick for Rodney Fern! Now, here's where injury gets added to insult. For what it's worth, Chelsea are awarded a penalty, which they take, and, yeah, they miss. But do you remember the Liverpool game a moment ago? It's got to be taken again. But they take it again. And they miss it again. And again. Across from Brecken and Ronnie Moore. That is a brilliant goal. The director of this game is now fed up with showing us celebrations. So he shows us this man again. I don't know why. He's a fine looking chap. Keeper. He declines to accept the advice. And oh dear, oh dear, what a disaster. And Goddard in the end. That really was total disaster. Well, total disaster perhaps. But what beautiful, flowing, one-touch football led us there. Watch as the defence is absolutely sliced open. Well, they sliced themselves open. And leaving the last man with but a simple tap-in. Wouldn't it have been just beautiful, though, if Goddard had missed this? Alan. Let's see if yellow shirt's back. And that's going to come to Shanks. And it's deflected in by Brennan. This also sums up a lot about a right hammering. On other days, this deflection would not have found its man. Found him like an exocet. And even then, his effort gets that vital and stupid lift straight into the goal. As a supporter, it's about now you realise you've lost your train ticket home too. 
Rhoda timing his interception superbly and leading a promising counter. Walsh to his right, two others to his left. Goes to Walsh, Allen is now unmarked. And Goddard gets it in. And Bowles finds Wicks, and Goddard couldn't get on the end. Well, you say beautifully taken, Barry, but have another look. This is a ridiculous goal, engineered by some ridiculous men, all throwing some particularly ridiculous shapes. Wallace, Alan to his left, boy can go alone. Here is Alan. That's five, so simple. Here's Wallace. His bowls, if he can get there. And that will be a penalty without any question. Just watch where the photographer positions himself. Well, the goalkeeper moved and was in no position to make a stop. Bowles immediately to Walsh, draw Thompson, two against one in the middle. Walsh taking a long time to take advantage of that fact. Here is the man over. And, oh, dear, oh, dear, it's Rona who scores in the end. Rona who got it in the end. This dopey goal is a study in team relations. Glenn Rhoda, you'll see, is just happy to be part of the attack. And when Clive Allen misses the initial chance, he's already celebrating. Gets the chance himself to finish it off and thinks, be happy for me, lads, I've just scored. But how happy is Clive Allen? Meantime, the fella on the line is waiting for that photographer. This game can be subtitled John's Nightmare or I Should Be So Lukic. Maybe 36 years old now. He's played better passes than that. Now he has to check to cover John Hollins. And an own goal by John Lukic. Shocking own goal by John Lukic. See, Lukic is too tall. We all know that. And when he has to come down and breathe the same air as the rest of us, He's always prone to do this sort of thing. Divine and now Talbot. Sunderland again. Arsenal have four waiting for the cross. Flicked on by Rick. Sanson was right in there and that was Gatting. And Arsenal go two in front. Here's Sansom who will keep it in. Collins joining Sunderland and McDermott in the middle, and it's Hollins! And that was surely over the line. Oh, but by no more than a yard and a half. Can you imagine all your family being in the stands on a day like this? Or oh, women, you fancy. You've got them tickets, you've swanked around beforehand, arranged to meet them for a drink afterwards. And then you turn in this steamer of a show. I've said this before, but so much of football supporting is about celebrating the loss of dignity. Usually in small ways, um, referee falls over, copper gets his hat knocked off, ugly defender scores own goal. Well, that's also true of the next game we're going to see, but it's in a much more subtle way. It's Arsenal versus Manchester United, November 1990. 
True, neither team is particularly loved outside their own set of supporters, and either side winning wouldn't be noted as that outrageous. And yet here were the circumstances. Arsenal were a very powerful team in November 1990. They were swaggering top gunners, haughty and proud. United was still an awkward, disappointing outfit whose manager, still Ferguson, was always threatened with getting the boot. Nobody doubted that Arsenal were going to show these would-be maestros the door that night. It didn't happen. And what followed laid the foundations for much of United's current success, confidence and reputation. It was November 1990. Tremendous amount at stake for both these clubs, particularly for Manchester United. Their chances of the league championship slipping away. Blackmore shot, hits with great venom! Terrific shot! And Manchester United go into the lead. Inside two minutes. Blackmore. Getting it to Sharp. Into Wallace. Oh, now for Hughes, another one. Mark Hughes, number two. But it's still with Manchester United and Lee Sharp under the right foot. It's another one. Three 0 A fantastic goal by Lee Sharp. I haven't seen the magic of Anders Limpar yet tonight. Maybe that's waiting for us in the second half. There's his free kick, up goes Pallister. In goes Bowles. And Thomas! Terrific save! Smith! And Arsenal get the encouragement of that early goal. Alan Smith. <laughs> Deafening noise here at Highbury now as Arsenal come looking for that second goal. Adams! Puts it over the line, Smith! Irwin, all some space here now for Hughes. No foul. Hughes finding Irwin. The cross is a good one, and it's a splendid goal there by Lee Sharp again. Hughes to Wallace. There's a lovely chance now for Sharp on the hat trick, and he's got it. Five for United, three to Lee Sharp. To Hughes, Wallace waiting in the middle, McClare's in there too, and it's another one, Wallace, it's six. The sky has fallen in on Arsenal tonight. While we're dealing with rampant Reds, here's one of my favourite performances of any football team ever. It's at Northampton with George Best. Before we see this cup game, bear in mind I hate underdogs. I really do. I can't bear tiny grounds full of rosy-cheeked optimists who only ever seem to turn up at football matches when they get a kind draw in the FA Cup. And besides, these days, plucky underdogs almost expect to win. Well, if ever there was a case of, sorry folks, this fairy tale is a grim one. It happened February 1970, Northampton versus Manchester United. Dixie McNeil. Oh yeah. Perrin forward for Kidd. In the middle is Morgan and Best. Book could lose it, it's Best! Georgie Best! Well, what a comeback! What a way to come back into big time football. Georgie Best, 1 0. Good jump then by Dave Sadler. Ferran through for Best. Here he goes again. Georgie Best. What a beautiful bit of running by this man. Fair brother. Charlton feeding Kidd. Best free in the middle. Willie Morgan coming over to help Kidd now. And a chance for Best. Here's the hat trick. There it is eventually. Well, well, well. Georgie Best makes it a hat trick. 
but that third one is the easiest he'll ever score. Easy, but Northampton manager scramble. And what a scramble. What a terrible surrender of the male dignity chromosome. Four men forward, Kidd on his left, Morgan in the middle with Best, and on the far side is Claren. Brian Kidd. Saver then was Brooks. Kidd again. Here's Best. Number four. Georgie Best, just the tiniest touch. Touch for Kidd. Brian Kidd. If Sadler sure as a rock. There's the substitute, Burns. Right in action right away. Best going through the middle. He's on for five. There it is. Oh, Georgie Best. And what a difference this man makes to any front line. There's George Best. Two Burns. Has Kidd forward on the far side of two unmarked men. One of them is Willie Morgan, who should get another goal here. No, Kidd does. Well, you've got to feel sorry for Brooke then. He made the first save, dropped the ball, and Kidd whacks it in. That's number seven. Number four running is Clark. That's a good ball. There's Large. And now Dixie McNeil. It's there. Dixie McNeil gets one back. Kidd. Winning this ball. Faced by Rankmore, who has a chance to intercept. Kid not able to move as fast as he was earlier. Kid who's twice been down with an injury. Here's Clarend. Best. Here's the record. There it is. Georgie Best sets a new scoring record for Manchester United. Six goals in a game. Rankmore getting it forward. As Kiernan moves in on four, five defenders, United defenders. Fairbrother. Cross ball, Large going in. And he's got it. Frank Large. Let's have some balance, shall we? Let's show Old Trafford that it's just when the season is tootling along swimmingly, it's clear blue sky out there, you're dealing with your fixtures with your hat on the side of your head, it's just then when fate decides to slip a little lead into the opposition's boxing gloves. Rogers. Oh, nicely inside the fullback for Mulligan. Here's a chance and a goal. Scored by Mulligan, but made beautifully by Don Rogers. So enter Dennis Law, who should Paul Gascoigne ever forget is the great godfather of the scene stealing cutaway shot. So it looks as though that great character Dennis Law comes on for Manchester United. Frank O'Farrell now come away from the Director's box to be in the trainer's bench with Malcolm Musgrove and the injured Tony Dunn. So Law had had his boots inspected to make sure the studs were all right. And good play there by Bobby Bell. Now the chase is on. Rogers going faster than any of them. Still with Rogers. Played inside for Mulligan. And another goal! Paddy Mulligan's second! Made for him by Don Rogers, just as the first one was. Whittle. Rogers, and he's onside, Don Rogers. Six in one side now. That's there! That's number three! Tremendous presence of mind by Don Rogers. Here's up. And Whittle goes on. Hughes. Whittle. Well, that's incredible. Yes! Yeah! his first goal 
and laughing along with it, United's Politburo from left to right, Franco Farrell, Matt Busby, and I think that's Patrick Moore at the end. Keep it down, but within 48 hours, they've fired O'Farrell. What did he just say? He said they're firing the man in front of me on Monday, sir. Clive coming in for Paris. And this has been their greatest afternoon. And there's Rogers. Will this be five? It's going to be five. And he's fired. Alex Stepney glowers up at the director's box. And as you can see, Franco Farrell enjoys the full support of the ball. Here's a little bit of background. Gary Bailey, a famous South African. But did you know his dad used to play in goal at Ipswich? And it had always been Gary's dream to turn out at Portman Road. Sadly for him, he was the only United player that day who even felt like playing in Suffolk. So here's Sloan, the fair-haired one, taking Ray Wilkins' place in midfield. It's his first full game. Had a good ball forward, and Brazil's in the possession. He's not offside. Brazil scores! And Manchester United's marking let them down, and Brazil tucks one past Gary Bailey. Deep for Paul Mariner. Paul Mariner gets there. Brazil is onto that one. Mariner... It's in. Forward for Tyson. Burley's so free on that right-hand side. Jordan comes over the cover now, and here's Gates in here. And the referee's in the way of Buchan. And Bailey in trouble here as Mariner puts it in. Back to Mura. Forward here for Mariner to turn. They hit a United player. It was Sloan. And Mariner's in here well. Beautiful run, he's down, and it's a penalty. Tyson. Saved it. Well done, Gary Bailey. Buchan. Gates. Muren through well here with Mariner's help. Mariner now with a chance to wing one. Down he goes, another penalty. He's done it again. Once more. And off the line by Koppel. Unbelievably, having saved two penalties, the referee's going to make him face a third. So here's one for the old man. Oh, Gary Bailey. What a great round of success that was. Jordan with Osman there waiting to pick it up. Straight to Gates. Tyson, the space there is still huge and inviting. Mariner. And here comes Brazil. Gary Bailey totally exposed again, not his fault. Muren losing Sloan, finding Brazil. And can this one fall to Mariner? No. It might well fall to Tyson, though. He's got it. Tyson now. Tyson again. What a disaster again in that Manchester United penalty area. If you've got any friends who are droning on and on recently about the invincibility of Manchester United, you may want to make them watch this clip and remind them that next time they sing lustily of being by far the greatest team the world has ever seen, there was that period, particularly during 1980, when their defence simply couldn't have been more obliging. In comes Beatty. Oh, the goalkeeper was right out of position. Koppel has it, and he gives it away. Gates is in there. The chance for number six. There's two players in support. Mariner has done it. It's a hat-trick. It's six. Earlier on, you might have thought I was being a little tough on underdogs. Well, let me tell you why. I speak from bitter experience. Millwall v Ipswich in the cup quarter-finals. In those days, it took a cup quarter-final to get the cameras down to our ground. Fact was, they thumped us 6-1. At our own ground, 
on network TV. 6-1. Sadly, the tape of that game has been lost. Not so for all you West Brom and Southampton supporters. We've managed to find what Ipswich did to you. Weird team, Ipswich, are they? Bennett and Johnson. Lambert. Brian Hamilton's wide on the left. This is Lambert. Oh, my word, what a shot. Brian Hamilton now. But why not and, uh, Lambert over the far side? And Johnson, too, if Burley can get it over. Not strong enough. And now it's Wymark. You know, I'm no scientist, but isn't a pattern starting to emerge here? Haven't all these teams we've seen on the wrong end of a right hammering deserved it? Look at this defending from Hugh Fisher. And most telling of all, he doesn't even bother to watch the outcome of his blunder. Just turns away before it's in the net. And here's a kind of celebrating we don't see much of anymore. Number nine, Johnson, lets him know it's ill-advised, even in 1974. Mills. Yes! Brian Hamilton! Now, who'd have thought of taking a crack at it when you're faced with such a well-organised wall? Yeah, such vision deserves to be rewarded. Johnson, now Weimark. Johnson, Weimark. to Johnson Mills Oh my word what on earth happened to that and so the latest in a long line of shots of goalkeeper Eric Martin looking wretched and who says goalkeeper's shirts used to be better years ago Even on the slow-mo, it's not perfectly clear what does happen to this ball. Goes BT. Weimar. Mills then. On his left goes Torbert to make a different angle. Excellent running once more. Woods is down the line, but he's tightly marked. In comes Weimar. Knocked down nicely to walk. Beatty comes up. And out here, there's a lot of freedom for Mills behind. Beatty's going on his own. Oh, Pick that one up. Truitt doing well to get that one against Osborne. Burley keeping it in well. Weimar to Mariner. What a beautiful opening. Oh, what a goal. And Mariner. Waiting for help. Mariner on his own. Oh, what a goal! And he's battled away and won it back again. Weimark. Key 
Steve Perchin. Weimark is with him. Now Woods is over this side. Weimark perhaps will go alone. And now, remember this, Gillingham 11, Liverpool 1. No, you can relax. It never happened. Would have been nice, though, wouldn't it? See, with Liverpool, an entirely different criteria applies. 4-0 or 5-1 is seen as a hammering for them. A bit like Wimbledon. They never get walloped, neither. However, I am eternally grateful to Liverpool for one result in recent years that stands as still an avalanche, a nightmare, and they dumped it all over Crystal Palace. Nine goals to nil. Now, I don't care what you say. No team is entitled to meet any other team in an ordinary league game and win nine nil. For the losers, it should mean instant relegation. Or maybe they should be just banned for a couple of months from playing anyone. Or better yet, disband them altogether so they never play anyone else again. I well, you get the picture. In researching this video, I went to the Oxford English Dictionary to look up the word defeat. There was just a picture of Crystal Palace's side that night. Elsewhere, defeat is defined as to reduce to submission in battle or contest, matter decided, to frustrate, to baffle, to annul, to conduct thinking that tends to bring around acceptance of inferiority. In other words, Liverpool 9, Crystal Palace 0. Here comes the inevitable Anfield penalty. And as John Aldridge places the ball on the spot, look at Palace's number six, O'Reilly. He's already making contingency plans for the breakaway attack. Plan on. John Barnes reminds us how good his party piece used to be. With the palace wall about as effectual as that Southampton two-man approach. Actually, has anybody got an abacus? I think I've lost count. What is this goal? 15? 16? Ah, goal number eight, which just leaves us with... Nine. Soon, much too soon for me, it's all over. Palace stagger off, stunned, bewildered, wrecked. John Aldridge goes to the cop end to offer up mementos. His shirt, his boots, and the soul of Steve Koppel. To this day, any vaguely acceptable result that Crystal Palace have against Liverpool is seen as avenging that night. But truthfully, nothing ever will. Ever. Nothing can ever soothe the trauma of a result like that. Derby know it. They met Liverpool as recently as 1991. I suppose Palace could take some comfort that their annihilation didn't happen in front of their own fans. No such luck for Derby, whose team at the time included Mark Wright and Dean Saunders. Of course, they were soon to both join Liverpool. Peter Shilton was soon on his way to Plymouth. Now, Schultz was never one to dismiss defeat with a light laugh, and yet this must remain his blackest afternoon. You're watching the first of seven goals he conceded that day. So, out of kindness to him, let's just rattle through them. Derby pulled himself level. This made it 2-1. Three one.
Wait for it, wait for it. Six one. The final goal of the afternoon, and by now, the best Derby can hope for is a draw. Excellent though these freak shows may be, isn't it tragic that TV sports directors rarely bring us the images that truly reflect the football supporters' experience? Those moments of stunned silence we wanted to bring you, big shots of away supporters watching as goals 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 hurtled in against their team. That's the first thing you look for when your team scores a goal. Sadly, TV only wants to bring us the upbeat PR soft underbelly images of celebration, so they simply don't exist except occasionally, and you have to look here at the players as much as the crowd. This is a game between Derby County and Finn Harps of Ireland. Finn Harps arrived at the game on a wing and a prayer, but that prayer rapidly became the last rites. UEFA Cup, first round, and the biggest margin of defeat you'll find on this tape. Finn Harps, the signs weren't good from the first goal. All night, the goalkeeper played like he thought he was a linesman and just there to see if the ball crossed the line or not. Didn't have a lot of luck. And threw the ball out in a manner that was almost sad. This happened not once, but every time. Darby sniffed blood, and if it was to be a slaughterhouse, Charlie George wanted to be head butcher. Every attack was ending in a goal, despite the full-length dramatic dives of the keeper, who was still perfecting his match-winning throw. His defence would obligingly jump over free kicks. In the second half, the Irish motto became, Our time is your time. Please, there's no rush. Browse. If you can't find what you want at first, we'll be happy to help. You must remember at this point, there really were 11 players on each side. Here's the last goal of the evening. Now, children, can you remember how many goals we've seen? Well, it's 12, and as Derby manager Dave Mackay said afterwards, in the second leg, we will be underestimating the opposition. Now, if that seemed like arrogant showing off, what are we to make of TV's most notorious historical display of bullying, Leeds 7, Southampton 0? It's not just the result, it's just that never ever has one team swaggered and swanked so much at another team's expense. It was like a madness descended on Ellen Road, and they wanted to take the Saints and torment them, tease them, bait them. In fact, if Southampton had been animals, there'd have been national outrage. Trey to Bremner. Forward for Gray again, Jones, Gray, Clark out to the left, in comes Clark! Larimer. 
Clark. Jenkins. Giles. Free kick against Stokes. No, it's not given, but here's Lorimer. And I think that must count as a no goal. Strikes coming out. Hunter's offside. He's got back now. Play number six. Gray moving to the near post. Jack Charlton! Gray held off. Lorimer is underneath it. In comes Jones! Say that Leeds are playing for Southampton is the understatement of the season. Poor Southampton just don't know what day it is. Every man jack of this, of this Leeds side is now turning it on. Oh, look at that! It's almost true. The Allen Road crowd are lapping it up. The second home match running, Leeds United are turning on a brilliant show and the other team are just not on the park. Even when a pass goes astray, they can pick it up. got to feel some sympathy for Southampton. The gap between their position and Leeds is an almighty chasm. Jack Charlton is miles offside forward, that's why Lorimer's was holding it. Well, we've got to close now because, well, the tape's going to run out. It's your own fault. You should have bought a 180. But before you relax and feel relieved that your own team's personal hell wasn't on this tape, think again. We've got all those results, yes, even your hell, on the tape back here. Now, there doesn't have to be a volume two, and let's say I'm a reasonable man. Ten grand as a cash donation should see one or two of these results taped over with EastEnders, whacked from the face of the earth. The choice is yours. And while you think about it, have a good, hard, lingering look at the poor wretches, the faces of the defeated that we're going to play out with. Do you recognise anyone? Can you see yourself here? Sure you can. Have a good time, football supporters. And remember, I can see you sneaking out. I can see you sneaking out.
Are you still here? You're one of those people who plays the tape all the way to the end, are you? Well, you've been rewarded. Here's something of a bonus, and it's not something I wanted to do. On the last tape I made for VVL, I uh, made a bit of a boast. In the heat of the moment, a, a, a rash claim. It turned into a bet. Uh, firstly, this is what I said. I will say this, though. England will go to the USA in 94, and they're going to win the World Cup. In spite of everything, read my lips. We're going to win the World Cup in 94. Now, I said, if that doesn't happen, I'll quite happily sit there and let myself be abused, laughed at, do whatever you want. I, I won't say a word, and that doesn't happen often. Well, it didn't happen, so off you go. Oh, 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 okay, 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 that's enough. Isn't it? Jim, turn the lights out, will you?